In a previous video, I propose a neutral numerical board be created and publicly funded to provide objective analysis of data to assist many parts of the judicial system to understand what can be known, what can't, and the uncertainties in any key numbers relating to court cases, be they medical or otherwise. This board would provide clear, objective numerical information and could also help with the rock bottom conviction rates relating to fraud and insider trading cases. Such a numerical board would be split into different teams to minimise confirmation bias, including four sprint analysis teams to quickly dive in and clarify if there really is anything of concern or whether the offending data is just one of those statistical quirks you expect in random data. In this video, I seek to show what one of the sprint analysis teams from this board could have delivered quickly in relation to the Lucy Letby case, and in particular around the neonatal mortality at the Countess of Chester Hospital over the 2014 to 2017 period. My key source of information is the MBR Race UK reports, which have individual hospital level data for each of the 2014 to 2017 calendar years. These reports were all available well before the Letby trial began, so could, and almost certainly should, have been considered as a key information source for both prosecution and defence, although from what I can see, it was ignored throughout the trial. Here's an extract from the 2015 report to give you a feel for the level of information available. For each hospital, we get the total number of births, then both crude and stabilised mortality from stillbirths and for neonatals. Crude mortality rates are entirely factual. Simply divide deaths by births to get the rate. The stabilised mortality rates seek to allow for the easily available risk factors relating to each birth to give a more comparable figure across hospitals. Note that this risk adjustment doesn't allow for any of the harder to assess risk factors, such as staffing levels or staff training or nurse to doctor ratios or bacterial infections or sewage problems, for example. So not perfect, but better than not risk adjusting at all. At the bottom, we have the Countess of Chester Hospital and we can see the 2.96 crude mortality rate, which was noticed by staff at the hospital and began the series of events which ultimately led to Lucy Letby receiving 15 life sentences. Now, I want to be very clear that I believe that frontline staff who perceive an issue should very much raise their concerns if they see mortality spiralling upwards. These are incredibly vulnerable patients and anything we can do to react to emerging issues and to fix them quickly is obviously a good thing. What I do have concerns about, though, is the existing way in which such concerns can be quickly misled by bad statistics and so turn into a murder investigation that wastes resources, leads to unfair trials, and doesn't do anything to improve the hospital's processes or the neonatal mortality rate. Let's collate the Countess of Chester's hospital data for the 2014 to 2017 period, looking at crude mortality only. Here's our 2.96 neonatal mortality rate, which comes from nine neonatal deaths in 2015, compared to four in 2014. Now it's interesting to see four here as the baseline, whereas you very often hear that this hospital always had three neonatal deaths and any deviation from the level of three must be due to nefarious acts. So as stated before, what we're going to imagine in this video is that we're part of a sprint team that has been asked by the neutral numerical board to carry out a sprint analysis into this 2.96 figure. Now, there is stabilised mortality data available, but that's for another sprint team. We're just focusing on our one single aspect of this raised concern. All the sprint teams will come back and reconvene shortly to compare notes and decide if there's a genuine issue that needs to be more fully investigated by yet another team with more time, resources and all the data combined together. Let's do our first check. Would nine neonatal deaths be consistent with normal volatility around an expected crude neonatal mortality rate of 1.32 per 1,000 births? This is a simple binomial test, and we get the likelihood of nine or more deaths being just 2.2%. Zero or above eight deaths is outside of our 95% confidence interval. So this quick check gets a red rag rating against the hypothesis that 2015 crude mortality is expected given 2014s. So, beyond the Countess of Chester's Hospital's own data, what would we do with this information? 
Well, the board would get a data download from the NHS to analyze. Now, sadly for the purposes of this video, I didn't get a data download and I couldn't get ChatGPT or Power Query to extract tables from a PDF. So I've had to type in all the relevant figures manually. Yes, manually. I've been doing various spot checks along the way and so I believe the data I'm using is accurate, but there is of course a chance of typos. So do bear that in mind as we go on. Let's pull together a chart showing the 2014 to 2017 crude neonatal mortality rates for each of the 93 hospitals which reported crude data in each of those years. Now we have about 165 hospitals in the UK, meaning that this data is far from complete. And this includes the Countess of Chester Hospital, which has no crude mortality data for 2016, and so is missing from this chart, which is rather unfortunate. On this chart, the neonatal mortality rate for the 2015 accident year is shown in orange and 2017 in blue. It's a little hard to interpret as we have too much noise, but that in itself is a key finding. The crude neonatal mortality rate varies considerably by hospital by year. We need to be careful not to overinterpret any trends we see. And also we need to help NHS staff understand why, in some cases, we see the same blip in the data that they're worried about but it just isn't a real trend, it's just statistical quirk. Let's break this up a little to see if it makes a little more sense. So we have three categories of hospital, with hospitals shown alphabetically within each category. Surgical ICU is the most high risk, and we can see that these generally look to have the highest neonatal mortality rates. This is not to say that these hospitals are badly run or staffed, but rather it reflects that high risk neonatal babies are transferred into these hospitals from the surrounding normal hospitals when it's clear that those babies need additional care. Next we have the ICU hospitals and again these take on high risk cases and so on average observe higher neonatal mortality than normal hospitals but lower than the surgical ICU hospitals which presumably are more likely to operate on the babies in their care. So now we can see that there is some evidence that the riskiness of the babies does lead to a higher observed neonatal mortality. So the stabilized mortality data might well be more helpful, but let's push on with the crude data that is in our remit. We can also see that there is high volatility in the mortality rate seen in individual hospitals. On the left, we get jumps from four to seven deaths per thousand births, and on the right from one to four. So a low risk hospital can get a run of bad luck and look as dangerous as one of the highest risk hospitals in the country for that year. And this is a key thing to bear in mind when looking at what is fortunately such an unlikely event. The numbers are low, so we'll never get stability and randomness will give us lots of leaps and bounds in the figures. It's incredibly unlikely. The Countess of Chester has a constant mortality of three neonatal deaths each year. Much more likely it bounces from close to zero to close to double figures, just through natural random noise in each year. Let's have a quick refresher on correlation and causation. Here is a chart showing the simple average of neonatal mortality by the first letter of the hospital name. I've excluded those letters where we have less than four hospitals with that first letter to avoid spurious results. And we're left with the definitive fact that hospitals which start with the letter U are more than twice as dangerous for neonatals as hospitals which start with the letter R. Dig a little deeper and we see that all the hospitals whose names start with R are actually called Royal Something Hospital. Now, obviously the name of a hospital is not going to change the inherent health of babies born there, nor is it going to change the behavior of the NHS staff working there. So there's clearly no causal relationship between the name of a hospital and its clinical outcomes. We'll cover this in another video on this channel. But it is a good reminder that this sprint team should not just be churning out more and more tests for statistically significant results, Instead, it should start its task by creating a fixed set of hypotheses and then go out and test those against objective data. Unfortunately, from what I've heard and seen on this case, it looks like no one put their thinking cap on at the start when looking at the Letby stats as they didn't act in the same way. Let's get back to the MBR Race UK crude mortality data. Let's look at transitions, as in how a mortality rate moves from one year to another for the same hospital. Here's a chart showing the crude mortality rate in 2014 against the mortality rate for the same hospital in 2015. I've sorted by the 2014 rate in blue 
so we can see how things move from year to year. Now we do have the Countess of Chester Hospital data in here. Can you spot it? The staggeringly poor mortality experience that was picked up by those perceptive people at the hospital and sparked a murder investigation? Now I posted this chart up on my community tab as it was striking how chameleonic the experience at the hospital was despite a court finding that there was a mass murderer rampaging through the ward. Here, I'll highlight the Countess of Chester for you. Clear jump up from a fairly low base, but hardly exceptional to the naked eye. Neither the 2014 or 2015 experience at this hospital really shouts anything other than mediocre. Let's see if we can put some science behind what looks obvious from the chart. Firstly, here's the ratio of the rate of neonatal mortality between 2014 and 2015. Again, can you spot the staggeringly terrible deterioration at the Countess of Chester Hospital that made it obvious that a murderer was on the loose? Let me highlight it for you. So yes, yeah, a tiny bit higher than several hospitals with similar mortality to it in 2014. But hardly an outlier when you look at the range of movement seen in just 2015. Let's look at annual movements in crude neonatal mortality across 2014 to 2017 for our 92 hospitals. So we have 92 times 3 equals 276 data points, which gives us this fairly stable percentile plot of transitions. We have the individual percentiles going along from left to right. A 0.8 percentile means that 80% of hospitals saw a lower increase from one year to the next than this hospital. And from bottom to top, we get the actual change in crew mortality from one year to the next. So a value of 1 means an additional 100% to the mortality rate, in effect a doubling. We can see the median hospital generally sees no change in mortality rate from one year to the next, but many do see quite big jumps up and down. Let's add in the Countess of Chester, and we see that the jump up in 2015 of 1.24, i.e. it more than doubled, gives us a 95th percentile result. This means that 1 in 20 hospitals see a greater jump up in mortality in any given year. Now, we often talk about 95% confidence interval test. And this would typically be two-sided. So we would be looking for the worst 2.5% of outcomes and the best 2.5% too. Remember, we would have called out zero neonatal deaths as outside our range earlier in the video. We could make our test one-sided, in which case we would just look for the worst 5% of outcomes. And on this basis, the Countess of Chester Hospital would have triggered this test, just. But we would probably be much more concerned by the other 5% of hospitals the other four or five out of the 92, which would perform worse. Still, for our sprint report back to the scoping board, this test will give an amber rag rating. No, if we had the crude mortality data for 2016, this would be helpful for further demonstrating whether the experience was exceptional or not. But this isn't available for the Countess of Chester Hospital, unfortunately. So we'll just have to focus on 2015 experience when looking at the crude mortality data. Let's consider another angle, that large movements are more likely in hospitals with low mortality rates, and hence the movement observed should be considered in relation to the start point. For this purpose, I split the observed neonatal mortality rates into 10 bands with broadly the same number of hospitals in each band. I.e., if you pick a hospital at random, it's just as likely to be in band 1 as band 10. I can then track both the start and end point for each annual movement as per this table. Now, there's quite a lot of information to take in here, so let me take you through it. Firstly, we have the starting band down the left-hand side, with 1 being the lowest mortality rates down to 10 at the bottom. Next, we have the finishing band along the top, with again 1 being the lowest mortality rates on the left, with 10 on the right. So a hospital with consistently good mortality experience would be in the top left of this exhibit. The numbers in the grid indicate the number of hospitals in each combination of start and finish band. I've colour coded the actual transition so you, you can see where the action is. The red zones in the top right and bottom left indicate that hospitals just don't move from having great to terrible mortality experience or vice versa in a single year. Our old friend the chi squared test gives a 0% result against the hypothesis that each hospital has an equal chance of moving to any band. So there's clearly a correlation between start and endpoint on display. And which bands did the Countess of Chester move from in 2014 and two in 2015? It started in band four and went to band nine. 
A big jump for sure, but was it statistically significant? Well, in our historic data, we have 28 hospitals who started a year in band 4. Of these, 4, 2 plus 2, went to at least band 9. So there's a 1 in 7 chance of such a leap or worse. Of these, 4, 2 plus 2, went to at least band 9. So there's a 1 in 7 chance of such a leap or worse. Which is 1 in 7 or 14% and so way within a 95% confidence interval of expected movements. So on this basis, the Countess of Chester is getting a green RAG rating on this much more reasonable test, which allows for the starting point and correlation between years when considering mortality changes. One last piece of information to review, looking at crude mortality rates. What is the comparison between stillbirth and neonatal mortality? Well, each of the dots on this chart represents a single hospital in a single year and compares their stillbirth mortality from left to right against their neonatal mortality from bottom to top. As you can see visually, there's a wide spread here and no great alignment between the two. I put a dotted trend line on and we get a 20% correlation between the two, but nothing too interesting to say for the time it took me to type in hundreds of stillbirth related numbers. Here are the Countess of Chester's data points for 2014 and 2015. We do get a higher neonatal mortality alongside higher stillbirths in 2015, although the increase is more than we'd normally expect. We can also see that the 2015 data point is much less normal, but hardly exceptional. So again, nothing particularly insightful here. There's no great statistical test here, so we won't even give it a RAG rating. So in summary, what would we be reporting back to the scoping team of the Neutral Numerical Board? Here's our scorecard. Red RAG rating on 1.32 neonatal mortality from 2014 remaining unchanged, but leading to nine deaths in 2015 due to bad luck. An amber RAG rating on a 124% increase in neonatal mortality from 2014 to 2015. But a green RAG rating for that same increase when considering the starting point, i.e. big kicks are much more possible on small data. We noted that crude neonatal mortality data is very noisy. We're missing crucial 2016 data, which would help to assess the Countess of Chester Hospital more accurately. So the data itself is not particularly reliable, and we'd recommend relying more heavily on other sources when the scoping team make their decision about whether to advance or not. We do think that NHS staff should continue to raise concerns from crude mortality data, but it'll often just be random noise that they are seeing. We've seen examples where crude mortality can make a low-risk hospital look worse in any one year than some of the most high-risk hospitals in the country. We've looked through stillbirth data, but this added very little to our analysis. So yes, we can see a jump up in 2015 neonatal mortality at the Countess of Chester Hospital, but it's not a clear case of being such a terrible year that it's obvious something malicious has occurred. We'd certainly expect some strong findings from the other sprint teams before concluding we need to dig deeper into this reported spike in mortality. In a future video, I'll come back and dive into the stabilised mortality data, which the MBR Race UK reports include, and which intend to allow for some elements of the risks faced by each of these hospitals. We'll see if this brings us more helpful insights to report back to the scoping team. Thank you for watching. Let me know what you think of this video in the comments. This has been a Justice by Numbers production. This is a new channel, so please like, subscribe, comment, recommend, and share to help support this channel, and allow me to produce more videos to help us all get to the truth of Lucy Letby's case. Thank you, goodbye.